you. Imagine that you wake up in a place where you feel too hot and sweaty. You reach out to drink some water and all you taste is plastic. You want to take a nice cool shower and there is no running water from the tap. You walk through the street and seeing people on both sides of the road with children but without any proper food, clothing or shelter. You hear them coughing because the air quality was so bad. You see buildings of all sizes but there are no trees in sight. You smell smoke in the air and the sky looks brown. This is where I grew up. I'm sure millions of other people in the world are also experiencing the same kind of living situation to this. Living there, I had a dream, a dream to positively impact the lives of those people. All my life, I was living within my comfort zone, so I reached out to my nears and dears for guidance and inspiration. But they love me so much, so just like every Indian parents, they advised me to follow the status quo because they did not want me to you know, uh, live outside my comfort zone. So they just wanted to make sure. And I did, just like every other Indian children. Um, days passed and weeks passed, witnessing same people again and again living on the streets without proper food or couldn't breathe. One day, I said to myself, what are you doing, Praveen? That's enough. You can't do this anymore. So I decided to quit my job and move far away from my hometown to seek for guidance and inspirations elsewhere. So in September 2016, I came to Victoria, BC to pursue my master's degree at Royal Roads University. I took a course called uh, Intercultural Studies and International Business Management. One of the course requirement was for students was to revisit our culture and share the knowledge with all the classmates so, you know, students of that particular course can learn how to conduct business in multicultural settings. So I did. I learned a lot about my culture and tradition. And something that I remembered, I learned how the alphabets of my native language, Tamil, was taught. Just like how English is taught by saying A for apple, B for ball, and C for cat, I learned Tamil by saying, ah, for aram saya virumbu, which means always intent to do good things. Ah, for aruvadu sinam, which means never take decisions when you are angry. E for yelvadu karavel, which means aid to your capacity. Wow, it was mind blowing because one message was repeated again and again by our ancestors which was give. That changed my life because that was a groundbreaking experience for me. Throughout my life, I was only focusing on asking but not on giving. I started to give. As I started to give, I started to receive more than I ever gave. I made professional connections with the, like experts in the field of sustainability and observed their invaluable advices. I gained courage, learned how to manage, like, you know, troubles, challenges, and all those. And because of all those, now I run my ethical business management consulting firm called Vugam. At Vugam, my team and I help businesses and uh, nonprofits across the world to strategize and execute sustainability-related projects. So through those projects, we provide access to people across the world to have healthy food and fresh air. So finally, now I live my dream. If you are frustrated and have no clarity in life, so it's always better to take a pause and take on an adventure. The adventure that I took 
was to pursue my international education in Canada. That's what brought me back to, connected me back with my ancestral root. I am Praveen. I invite you all to stop seeking, but to start giving. Nandri. When I was growing up uh, and I was learning to read, uh, my mother gave me my very first storybook written by Rudyard Kipling, The Jungle Book. I remember flipping through those colorful pages and getting lost in the unbelievable adventure of this little boy, Mowgli, uh, who somehow lands up in a wild forest or the jungle. As luck would have it, instead of becoming prey to the pack of wolves, he gets raised among them as one. Along the way, he meets Baloo the bear, Bagheera the black panther, Ka the snake, who are not just his friends, but his mentors, who teach him the laws of the jungle. I think this story has uh, made me think of my own world in a lot of different ways. And I recall it today because about a year ago, I took an adventure of my own. It was exciting and terrifying, just like Mowgli's. Namaste. I'm Suraj Khanka from India. And moving abroad and pursuing international education was like getting lost in a jungle to me. As I was stepping into an unknown territory without actually knowing if I would find what I expected to find. Before my arrival here, I was well placed in a digital education firm where out of the various job functions, one of the job functions was to find synergies with the companies of the similar nature. It was to expand market both within the country and outside the country. But when I was doing that, uh, I understood that I couldn't really get the challenges related with uh, different arenas and the risks involved. So I needed to enhance this knowledge and fill the gaps in my skills. So I decided to pursue a global management degree here in Canada. When I arrived, the only document which would serve as the piece of my identification was my Indian passport. So while I was in the process of getting the Canadian IDs, I would think that this is actually like building myself from the scratch. And like Kipling wrote, to each his own fear, suddenly this was mine. To top it all up, I was going to learn new subjects that I had never touched upon before, and I was going to meet professionals from different countries altogether. This was definitely not the comfort zone I was used to, and I did not know exactly what to do about it. Thankfully, I had Bagheeras and Baloos in the form of professors and classmates, uh, who through their unique pedagogy and experience taught me how to hunt for good grades while defending against those subjects that I was dreading initially. I was also taught on uh, taking my education and all the reading materials at my own pace and convenience. I was given real life case studies which would let me expand my knowledge beyond textbooks. My program of study was actually cohort based which meant all of us having these unique experiences had to come together and work in a team as a unit. It was like forming a pilot global network within the confines of a classroom. But to me, it was a great way of understanding what Kipling wrote when he said, for the strength of the pack is the wolf, for the strength of the wolf is the pack. As a team, we engaged in Socratic dialogues, we uh, practiced online simulations, and that helped me gain deeper and broader perspective about the reading materials. But our program was intense, and some days I would feel like taking a back seat. But then there was a notorious component called contribution grade. And I think it was much like the character Ka, the snake who tries to, who tries to get to Mowgli and lure, her, uh, lure him to, through, through her charm and during the first encounter. That's what contribution grade did to me. It lured me every single time to contribute and participate. I think the story of 
the Jungle Book is not just about the boy and the jungle. It's about Mowgli finally defeating Sher Khan, the tiger. To me, tiger, Sher Khan could be anything. It could be a new subject, it could be this new environment, or, a, or an external entity. But to my surprise, it was rather internal. It was my own limiting mindset. Back in my country, my parents, my teachers, my friends, they, shared, they showed great confidence in me, and they always felt that I have far greater potential. But I guess I was just too comfortable to push myself. It was this limiting mindset that would just let me do efforts to, enough to qualify. And that could be seen in my grades here. When I started, uh, initially I would just focus on the qualifying grade, and I was just a B, B plus student. But as I engaged truly with a, without my limiting mindset, my grades improved gradually. And it's not just about grades, actually, because honestly I'm still learning. But international education has definitely helped me deal with this limiting mindset. It has helped me carve shields that I can use to my defense when I go out in the world. Cross-cultural awareness, ra uh, rational and ethical decision-making, knowledge and skills required to fill the gaps in uh, different changing business landscapes. But more importantly, it has instilled in me a strong sense of self-awareness. So, when I say this, I say this because of the outcome of the journey so far. International education is like a jungle, for it has its own laws and it has its own challenges. It will challenge you to get out of the comfort zone, it will challenge you to face your fears, but it will reward you by giving ample learning opportunities. And if done correctly, it will reveal the path towards the growth. On that note, I would like to share last few lines that are some of my favorite lines from the book. Now, this is the law of the jungle, as old, as true as the sky. The wolf that shall keep it may prosper, but the wolf that shall break, it must die. Thank you. It has been an honor. You know, I'm a runner. Not your usual let's go run for a trail kind of runner, but I run from my problems. My name is Nagar, and I was diagnosed with major chronic depression a few years before coming to Canada. When I told my therapist that I was moving, she said, you can't run from this. But I was like, watch me. So I ran, and for a f couple of years after starting my program in Canada in 2016, I was pretty all right. I was happy, or, you know, acting like it. I got involved in a lot of projects, and I tried so hard to fit into the stereotype that I had in my mind. This perfect girl with perfect everything who doesn't need nobody. I was so driven by the fact that I have, for the first time, gone away from my family and a very oppressive culture, and it was my time to shine. And I did shine for a while, until last year that a lot of things went wrong. I had built a lot of hopes on meeting like-minded people in that year, people that I could finally share my passion with, that I could connect to, that I'll be able to share deep conversations with. But I all kind of did not care. They did not want to have anything to do with me because I was a bit much, a bit too loud, a bit too proud, a bit too sarcastic, a bit too feminist, and a bit too everywhere. You know, a bit much. I also started reading a lot of feminist books that made me very aware of the discriminations I faced every day as an international student because of how I looked or the accent that I apparently had. And that hypersensitivity made me adopt a pseudo-white name, just, just to make it easier. The buildup 
of all the small letdowns really brought me down. I wasn't really doing anything anymore, not going out with friends, not going to classes like I used to, not volunteering, which was my saving grace when I came to Canada. And it all came to a head on this really sunny morning after weeks of constant rain that I woke up and I thought, I just want to cease to exist. I knew that if I stepped out of the house, I was extremely likely to make a very wrong choice. So I didn't. I, I stayed in bed like any other bad day. I was very lucky to be aware of my feelings, to have my partner, and to have a great counseling system that I could reach out to, that, I, that could help me and bring me off of that edge. But I could never really shake that feeling of loneliness. My depression and anxiety took such an extreme toll on my physical health that I was partially disabled for a few months. And it wasn't until I finally admitted to myself what it was and I went to a professional medical health clinic that I was able to start my healing journey. Now that I'm slightly out of the mud and my brain isn't that foggy anymore, I can't help to think what would happen if I didn't have those few key people that I did. And what breaks my heart is that despite being well known in my community, no one came to me saying, hey, what's up? You haven't been around much. Are you doing all right? How's it going? In any given year, one in five Canadians will personally experience a mental health issue or illness. If there was a hundred of us in this room, that would be at least 20 people who are here smiling, laughing, pretending everything's fine, but this morning, they weren't even sure that they could muster the energy to get out of the bed. At least 20 people who might, but might not, have those few key contacts that will help them off the edge when they're at their lowest. It takes nothing to be kind. It's 30 seconds of picking up your phone, texting someone on social media, saying, hey, how's it going? I haven't seen you around. You haven't talked a lot. Is there anything I can do? to make your life easier. Your attention and your kind words will save someone from the edge of a building. So just pay attention and be kind. I know that this might have been a bit of a heavy topic, but I want to make sure that we all end in a great note. So I'm going to ask you to do something in a second. I want you to turn to the people, the person next to you, Look into their eyes, smile, just so you both know that you're there for each other. Okay? Everyone has someone next to them? Yes! You're there for each other. Yeah? Okay. If you feel not great, or if you can think of someone who might need help, we have business cards and brochures from our great counseling system that you can take. If you need to talk, anyone, talk to anyone, if you need other resources, they're there to help you. Thank you. Think back to the first time you stepped into a classroom when you arrived here on campus. You took a look around the room and you noticed that the persons in your cohort were from various cultures. What kind of assumptions did you make? What came to mind? When you saw me, whether it be now in this setting or prior to today, what crossed your mind? My name is Danielle, and I am from the beautiful island, Jamaica, which is located in the Caribbean. Six years ago, I opted to leave my country 
and go to a neighboring Caribbean country, the Bahamas, to pursue my undergrad degree. I wanted a fresh start, and I also wanted to venture outside of my comfort zone. I went, and I found out that my, the cohort that I had consisted of many persons from across the Caribbean, and it was considered our own melting pot. During my tenure, I learned a lot about other cultures just by living and learning with these individuals. But in 2015, that all came to an end, and I had to go back home. After two years of working, I thought to myself, I want a similar experience, but this time on an international scale. I knew that my intercultural interactions had made me more open-minded and had also given me the chance to see things from different perspectives. And these were traits I wanted to develop. So after extensive research, I decided that Canada was the place to achieve that goal. After all, the country positions itself as a cultural mosaic, and they also have a multiculturalism act that not only preserves multiculturalism, but promotes it. So I applied for Royal Roads, the only school I applied for, got through, and in two months, I was on my way to Canada. So on April 9, 2018, I landed here and I was beyond ecstatic to start my new adventure. And I thought to myself, this is gonna be my best experience yet. But it wasn't quite what I expected. Yes, the population was in fact diverse, but I thought cross-cultural awareness was not as prominent. A lot of persons tend to hear things about other cultures through the grapevine, and we just run with it without seeking any validation or seeing if this is accurate. I recall one day sitting at the bus stop, waiting for the very unreliable 52 to take me to school. <laughs> and a sweet elderly old lady came up to me and she asked me the time. I told her, and of course, through our exchange, she detected an accent. She asked me the infamous question, where are you from? As a proud ambassador of my country, I responded beaming with pride. But what happened next was quite appalling. She said, wow, your English is good for somebody who comes from Jamaica. I was like, okay. <laughs> I was covertly upset, of course. And I thought to myself, maybe she's just unaware, and maybe I should make this a teachable moment, which I did. So I politely responded to her and I said, yes, we do have a very popular dialect called Patois, but in fact, the primary language of Jamaicans is the Queen's English. <laughs> For her, <laughs> that was an aha moment. She walked away knowing much more about my culture and I happily walked away as well, knowing that I was the one who gave her that information. But that wasn't the only misconception or stereotype I've had to face since I've been here. I've heard things like, you don't look like a Jamaican, you don't sound like a Jamaican, or even you look Nigerian. And I said to myself every time, what does a Jamaican look like? Or what does a Nigerian look like? I've been asked many times since I've been here, at least 15 times, if I smoke marijuana because I'm a Jamaican. <laughs> I always say no, and the response is almost always, are you sure you're Jamaican? <laughs> <laughs> but for anyone who has a similar mindset, I'm so sorry to disappoint you, but smoking marijuana is not a skill that we learn growing up in Jamaica. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we ought to ask questions and not project these notions on people. Find out the facts, find out the information. But I said my favorite projected notion would have had to be when a guy came up to me one day and said, you know what I was told? I was told that black people's hair doesn't grow. And I said to myself, <laughs> should I be angry or should I be amused? <laughs> After all, this is hair on my head that sprouted from my scalp. So that should be enough to debunk this myth that my hair does not grow. <laughs> Anyways, I found it to be another teachable moment. And I told him that, you know, there are several things you have to consider 
when you think about the rate at which someone's hair, hair grows, it could be genetics, diet, climate, but there are so many things that you have to consider beyond ethnicity. But through my reflections, I've come to notice that having these conversations is a perfect way to make persons more aware of my culture. But there are two sides to this coin. These conversations can also make me more aware of other cultures. After all, that's why I came here. So I implore you all in this room to make your experience a holistic one and not just gain that formal education in the classroom, but go beyond those classroom doors and get that informal experience as well. Talk to each other. Learn about your peers, their values, and their way of life. I promise you, it will be a very rewarding experience. But throughout it all, just always remember, there's much more to a person than you see. That is my story. What's yours? Hi, I would also like to uh, reiterate what was said earlier about um, if what I'm going to be speaking about uh, is going to contain some sensitive subject matter. And if you do need to reach out to support, please feel free to do that. There are supports here to help you, and it is very important that we all take advantage of them. The last time that I had a drink was December 6, 2013. I was shaking from withdrawals. My bed sheets were soaked with detox sweats, and I had locked myself in my room so that I didn't have to confront my roommate who I had stolen alcohol from a couple of days before. My rent was due, and I was facing eviction. I asked my folks if I could move back in with them, but they had been through that before. They knew that I was just going to break into their wine cabinet and steal their money again. I had nowhere to go, and I was ready to kill myself. My name is Nathan Gregg, and I'm an alcoholic addict. Hi, Nathan. There's the alcoholics over there. <laughs> Even though my parents weren't going to let me move back in with them, they weren't about to let me, uh, they weren't about to give up on me either. My mom contacted a friend that she knew, who for the sake of anonymity, I'm going to refer to as Jim. Jim had been sober for some years, and he had agreed to let me stay with him and work a program of recovery with me, but under three conditions. First, he's going to kick me out after six months, so I had to get a place to stay. Second, I needed to get a job so that I could support myself. And third, I had to make the time that we spent together mean something. Step by step, Jim helped me to realize that recovery is not about not drinking or not using drugs. Recovery is about confronting the pain that had led us to drink and use drugs in the first place. I was putting my life together. About 90 days into my sobriety, a friend reached out to me and asked if I would like to apply for a job tree planting in northern Alberta. I spent about an hour on the phone with the crew lead, and I got the job. I was going to have a place to stay in a tent. I was going to have a job planting trees. And I was determined to make this mean something. My name is Nathan Gregg, and I'm a tree planter. Hi, Nathan. Tree planting is very hard work, but so is recovery. I figured that if I could stay sober for six months, then I can plant trees for four months. Tree planting gave my mind something to focus on of every minute of every day. It rewired my reward circuitry to be focused not on where am I going to get my next fix, but how many more trees can I plant today? How many more trees can I plant tomorrow? I was drinking lots of water. I was eating healthy food. I was exercising more than I had ever exercised in my life. And I was making money. After my first season of tree planting, I paid back all of my credit card debts, all of my fines from the different times that I'd gotten myself into trouble. And I even had enough money left over to spend five months in Central America, where I stayed until my second season of tree planting. After my second season of tree planting, I paid back my parents for all of the alcohol that I had stolen and all of the money that I had borrowed. And after my third season of tree planting, I decided that I was going to put myself through university. In the spring of 2018, I joined in the founding of a tree planting cooperative called Tree Amigos in 100 Mile House, British Columbia. 
With Tree Amigos, I pitched the idea of a tree planting rehab that I was going to call Treehab. The idea was unanimously well received by the group, and we've been putting it into motion for the last year. After my first season with Tree Amigos, I worked as an intern for William Head Institution, which is a minimum security prison for men in Machosan, British Columbia, just outside of Victoria. I have since been involved with various support group meetings there, and I've learned about institutional work release programs. Incarcerated individuals are permitted up to 120 days out of the facility to work, earn money, and learn vocational skills. Treehab was going to be a perfect fit for this. Individuals could come and plant trees and get paid on a piece rate basis, meaning that the more trees that they plant, the more money that they earn. But Treehab is about more than just making money. When I was thinking about the therapeutic value of tree planting, I narrowed it down to six pr principles, and I used the acronym DECENT. Diet, exercise, community, employment, nature, therapy. Diet and exercise are a crucial component to healthy living, but they're largely left out of the conversation when we're talking about recovery from drugs and alcohol. A good diet and exercise plan can help to regulate mood cycles, sleep schedules, and it just feels good. Endorphins are the body's natural opioid, and incorporating a good, healthy diet and exercise plan to an addict's recovery can help restore our neurological and hormonal homeostasis to a healthy level. Community. Tree planting is really hard work. We have to endure freezing cold, boiling hot, mosquitoes, sore shoulders, sore knees, but we all endure these things together. A natural bonding emerges when we all share a common struggle. People who would otherwise never associate bond over that struggle. The same is true with support group meetings. People who would otherwise never associate bond over an, a common shared struggle of recovery. We're going to bring the support group out to the bush to plant trees. Employment. Being employed gives us a sense of purpose a reason to get up every day, a means to support ourselves, and for some of us, it's the source of our very identity. Treehab is going to offer meaningful employment to individuals who are looking to make a difference in their lives. Nature. Being out in nature can be a very humbling healing experience. Being away from the noise of the news, politics, social media, just planting for 8 to 12 hours a day, being out there alone can unpeel an onion of some unresolved traumas, and being there alone in the forest can offer a safe space for a grown man to cry without any judgment. Which brings me to the last point of therapy. As these traumas come to the surface, we need to be there to support one another. We spend up to an hour in the trucks to and from the block every day. Great place for a support group meeting. We can support each other in our struggles, set goals, and hold each other accountable to achieving those goals. We can also collaborate with elders, social workers, and counselors back at camp to provide a holistic therapeutic experience. My name is Nathan Gregg, and I'm a social entrepreneur.